Thanks for listening to the Belonging House Fellowship Podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto and the House of Artisans. We're in the halfway point of this series on the fivefold ministry. So hold up your hand. But hold up your hand. Wiggle your thumb. This is the apostle. The way and raised her hand. This is the prophet. This is the evangelist. We have to be very careful with this one. We have to, this is the pastor, and this is the teacher. Wiggle them all. It's a fivefold ministry. So we've talked a little bit about the apostle and the prophet. It's the last, but we've talked a lot about the prophet. And today we're going to wrap up the prophet and the apostle. Now, if you look at the hand, you know, if you don't have, if you've lost three of your fingers, but if you have this one and you have this one, you can do a, still do a lot. You can use chopsticks. If you have this one and this one, you can still write. You can still pick some things up. So these two go together. And what we're going to find is that these two go together. And this one, notice I do it this way, stands alone. And so we're going to talk about that one next week. The evangelist who's unique in the fivefold gifts. But we're going to finish this prophet and apostle today by talking about how we honor and receive. In the new covenant and the kingdom, human beings and how we relate to God, human beings and how we relate to God and one another are central. As I have said many times, and some of you can probably mouth it along with me if I start the sentence, the God of the Bible is the, the most, most relational, relational being, being in, in the universe. universe. As my friend Steve Siemens has said, to remove relationship from Christianity is to go against the grain of the Holy Trinity. I love that. And so, when we talk both about the prophet and the apostle, and all the fivefold ministries, we do not talk about specific roles, gifts, or functions. Although they do have specific roles, gifts, and functions. We talk about human beings. As, as I said in the beginning of this, we're talking about human beings, types of human beings. We're talking about people. And in the New Testament, other than the direction to tell, test the spirits to see if they acknowledge that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's from 1 John chapter 4. The New Testament doesn't talk a lot about how we sort out the prophetic message. It's kind of surprising, actually. There are not six simple rules to test prophecy. Now, a few weeks ago, I did give some kind of pastoral guidance about the prophetic, but we don't, there's not a list in the New Testament. But the New Testament, and Jesus especially, talks a lot about how we receive a prophet and an apostle, how we receive them. And Jesus tells us, that we will be judged at the end of our lives. And this is why I'm taking a week just for this subject. We will be judged at the end of our lives by how we receive the people God sends us. Whenever we move the focus to people, suddenly the question of honor becomes central. And I mentioned at the beginning, there's a pa passage of scripture you hear quoted quite a bit when we talk about the prophetic, which is Matthew 10, 41. Those who receive a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And this goes back to the days when there were schools of rabbis and there were schools of prophets. And so Jesus is the rabbi, as we've, as we've said many times, Jesus is the rabbi. 
in the disciples were his school. When Paul was in the school of Jesus, when you think when you get a rabbinical grid. So we are in the rabbi's school too. But I want to put this into context because because context is everything. So, so far, not really said anything you haven't heard me say before. I want to look at the context of this verse, largely in Matthew 10 and 11, and unpack it a bit. So if you want to open up your Bible, you can. I'm going to bounce around uh, because there's some really good direction for those who walk in the prophetic and apostolic calling, and also some direction for those who have experienced rejection. Because rejection is part of this. We've got honor and we've got rejection. So if you turn in your Bible to Matthew 9.35, that's actually where this passage starts. This is another one of those wonderful places where the chapter marking is really in the wrong spot. And, it, and the chapter should have begun just a little earlier. In Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus goes about teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease. And Jesus looks out at the crowd and he's moved with compassion for them. For they are like sheep without a shepherd. And then he prays that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. So right here we see that Jesus recognizes that this work is too big for him alone. And when God sees a problem, God provides a solution. And throughout the Bible, the solution is always a person. As my friend Jim Leach has said, human beings are the technology created by God to contain God. So if God wants to get into a situation, do you know what God does? God gets into a person. And then God sends the person into the situation. So when God sends you into a place, he's trying to get himself into the situation. And in this case, beginning in Matthew 10, 1, Jesus calls the 12 to himself. And he gives them power to do the same things he did. And he gives them directions on how they're supposed to go and where they're supposed to go and how they're supposed to behave. Because the 12 are this human technology to contain God, and they are the technological answer to what God is doing. Isn't that amazing? An interesting way to think about it. So in Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus called them apostles at this point. And we visited this a few weeks ago. Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. So Matthew uses Jewish language. And the Jewish language here is prophet. Apostle is not a Jewish word, so he uses the word prophet. And so right here, through these two Gospels, if you lay the two over one another, you start to see that the prophet and the apostle, as we've noted already, have an interrelated relationship. There's an interrelated nature to the apostle and the prophet. So whenever you look at a passage of scripture, you, you look for the, the heart of it. So we're going to go to the heart of this passage. And the, the heart of this passage is Matthew 10.30. Because it highlights the core of what we have already said about being an artistic apostle or prophet. Jesus tells them, for it is not you who speaks but the spirit of your father that speaks in you. It is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father that speaks in you. So right here, this is the heart of the matter. Remember I said that the apostle is like an ambassador for the kingdom. 
So if I go to the American Embassy in London, once I'm inside, actually, once I'm on the property and inside, legally, I am in the United States. And the diplomats I meet there and talk to are like I'm talking to the president and the Congress. Apostles are representatives with the di diplomatic immunity of the kingdom. When you talk to an apostle, you're talking to someone who represents heaven. You're talking to Jesus. That's the plan. And if I'm a prophet, I'm speaking on behalf of the Father. So when you listen to the word of a prophet, hopefully they're speaking by the Spirit of the Father. Honestly, I think a lot of the prophetic nonsense out there would completely disappear if more prophetic people had a sober understanding that they're called to only say what the Father is saying. Because we're all going to stand before the Lord, you know, and answer for these things we say. Jesus is saying here that when a prophet or an apostle goes somewhere, they are his representatives in that place. So the prophet speaks for the Father, and the apostle is the physical representative of Jesus. So once we establish these realities, we can look at this whole passage again, and we see that the way that someone receives a prophet or an apostle is really the way a person receives God. And Jesus says that the way they treated me is the way they're going to treat you. He says this all through this passage. And in Matthew's gospel, this is where we hear, take up your cross and follow me. And then Jesus says, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for the cities that reject you. Wow. Jesus says a similar thing to the Pharisees in over Jerusalem. How prophets and apostles are received has eternal consequences. Why? Because these two groups of people represent Jesus in a unique way. So if you reject his representatives, you reject him. And if you honor his representatives, you honor him until you receive the same reward. In the kingdom, everything is always personal. There's nothing impersonal in the kingdom of God. That's why a lot of theology is a mirage. It just is. It's a mirage. It doesn't work in the real world. If you bring it back to Jesus regularly, bring it back to Jesus, bring it back to the incarnation, and then you start to remember that the, the fivefold ministry is about the incarnation and that artistic apostles and prophets are incarnations of Jesus. It's all very clear. If you reject a prophet and an apostle, you're rejecting Jesus. It's very simple. And Jesus says this clearly in Matthew 10, 40. He that receives you, receives me. And he that receives me, receives him who sent me. We hear the same kind of language in another place, and it may, may have jogged your memory. John 17, if you are one in me, I, he prays that we would be one in him, just as the Father is one with him. And if we're one with him and the Father, then the world will know that we are his disciples. It's the same idea. And then finally, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. That's the context. So to sum this all up, Jesus calls and creates these representatives, prophets and apostles, and he gives them the abilities to represent himself. They are incarnations of the incarnation. And Luann, in an email a few weeks ago, uh, used this word performance art in what I've been doing. So 
apostles and, and prophets are performance artists because what Jesus did was the greatest performance art piece in history. They're acting out in revealing the kingdom of heaven into the earth. And then Jesus says how people treat him is how they will treat you. And Jesus says if people treat you badly, like they treated him, that you, you know, you have to take up your cross. Jesus says those who receive you will be rewarded. So people will be judged negatively or positively by how they treat an apostle or a prophet. And then Matthew tells us how we can recognize a prophet or an apostle. And this is very important. In the next chapter, chapter 11, John the Baptist is in prison. John's the last of the Old Testament prophets, as Jesus said, he was the greatest of all the prophets. And he's hearing about what Jesus and the Twelve are doing. He's in prison. And he sends some of his followers to Jesus and asks, are you the one we're waiting for? Now, John didn't doubt Jesus. He's already proclaimed who Jesus was. He's asking, is my life over? That's what he's asking. Is my life over? And Jesus responds, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So through these examples, Jesus, in essence, says to John, John, judge a tree by its fruit. I am bearing good fruit. It's the fruit promise that the Messiah would bear. So what kind of tree am I? I'm the tree. So the first key to responding to a, a prophet or an apostle is what kind of fruit do they bear? Anyone who comes to us, what is the fruit? Notice that Jesus did not say, John, I have the right endorsement from another ministry. John, I'm from the right denomination or the right stream or the right connection. John, I have the right CV. John, look at the letters behind my name. John, I have the right credentials. John, I'm in apostolic succession. John, I have fancy robes, but no fruit. No. Jesus said, judge me by my fruit. Jesus said to judge me by my fruit. Jesus said this. And a servant is not above his master. Then Jesus says, Blessed are those who are not offended by me. You know, God uses offense and being offensive as a weapon or as a, as a tool. God uses offense. It's one of his favorites. It really is. How many of you have encountered somebody who was offensive? In the church, in ministry, in the world. And then you find out that they really were somebody God was using. Some of you know that I, I had an encounter in my one of my many wild ministry experiences where I was backstage for a day at a Benny Hinn event and, and got to hang out with all the people there and meet Benny Hinn and everything. Now, a lot of people are offended by Benny Hinn, and I understand why. But you know what? I saw a lot of fruit that day. I saw, I saw more fruit that day than I think I've ever seen in one single encounter. Judge a tree by its fruit. So my guess is that even John, who was the greatest prophet before Jesus, may have been a little offended. Why would Jesus say that to him? 
Jesus is out at parties. John is fasting. Jesus is not a hermit. Jesus is not an ascetic. Jesus is hanging out with prostitutes and sinners. Jesus is embracing life to the full while John is in prison. <laughs> Do not be offended at me, John. An interesting thing about the Lord is, you know, the Lord doesn't judge the way we think he does. God doesn't line us up and judge us. Do you know what God does? God lets people self-sort. And if you watch, and I've seen this so many times, and, and this is what's going on in the world right now. People are self-sorting. You know, when Jesus returns, he doesn't have to put the sheep and the goats, and he doesn't have to sort them out because the sheep and the goats will have done it already. It's going to be very easy. God lets people self-sort. And I've seen this again and again, and, and you know, people choose sides. And when people choose sides, they decide their eternal destinies. That's the thing we don't think about. And God doesn't have to do a thing. God does not have to do a thing. Because God has given human beings sovereignty in the earth. And so God will let human beings sort out their own destinies. Isn't that interesting? And you see this all the time. God will send someone who's a polarizing figure and people sort themselves out. See it again and again in history. I've had a few redefining moments this year. Uh, and recently I've had a season where I've had actually gone through a shaking the dust off my feet with kind of a movement of, of that I've been associated with for a while. Last year in Israel, I had a very difficult trip where almost everyone on the trip, to be honest, treated me somewhat badly. And toward the end of the trip, at the end, at the altar of Melchizedek of all places in the city of David, the Holy Spirit gave me a very clear, strong word and, and, for those of you who know me, you know I don't just go up to people and say, I've got a word for you. I only do that if I know I have a word for somebody. And it was a serious word. It wasn't something to be taken lightly. And this person took great offense that I had interrupted her moment there. And she wouldn't let me give her the word. I said, well, that's fine. So I walked away. And the Lord said, go back. And the Lord said, she needs this word right now. And it was a serious word. It wasn't a light thing. And then she said, I've had enough, and I'm not going to put up with you today. And I was like, oh, that was interesting. It was personal. It wasn't about the word. It was about me. And I had been having this kind of thing going on over this time. And it was clear that through this trip, they were re rejecting me. It was a weird spiritual thing. You know, Robin Williams once said, it's one thing to feel alone. It's another thing to be in a room full of people who make you feel alone. That's really interesting. And to, to be honest, it's really part of taking up your cross behind Jesus because it's not about you. It's not you. Sometimes you respond to people or people respond to you. If you're carrying Jesus, they're going to respond to Jesus in you. And a lot of people don't understand that, you know, and there are, there's a few times and people and other people in my life where this has happened in my presence. I can just walk into a room. I don't have to say anything. 
without saying or doing anything, I bring a reaction. It happened in the retreat I was on, on last month. It's always bring. I walked into the room and it was a reaction. And I've mentioned over the years that God sent a, has sent us a number of unusual people. And, you know, I used to speak at conferences and the unusual people would come up to me. And I'd often look at the one who was wearing unusual clothes, colorful clothes, and I'd say, that one's one of my tribe. And often they were. Often they were somebody who'd read all my books. There was one time I was at a conference in Texas, and I walked in, and this lady, she was wild. She had this knit outfit on. She was actually looked kind of cool. And, and she walked by me, and she gave me this look. And then she said, Chris Otto, you're Chris Otto. And I said, <laughs> yes, I am. And she ran up to me. She put her arms around me and she said, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> she met she oh. me a hat. She gave me a hat. She was a sweetheart. She was a sweetheart. And, and it, it was because, you know, it, she was responding to what Jesus has put in me. You know, she just loved me. She loves Jesus. And when he does, you know, and this is the thing we have to learn. You know, uh, Bob Sorge wrote this great book on rejection and praise and how both are poison. And you can't have praise go into you because it will kill you. And you cannot have rejection go into you because it will kill you. Mm -hmm. They're not rejecting you. It's not about you. So when God sends some unusual people to me, you know, I have to really listen to God. And and uh, just for full disclosure, Rachel is my barometer person. So I tell Rachel if, you know, because I'm very welcoming and loving and, you know, I was raised liberal. So I tend to make them, I, I tend to be too loving sometimes and too welcoming. And so Rachel's job is to sniff them out, you know, and oh, like the dog here. And, you know, <laughs> Rachel's job, you know, is to help me have a little more discernment. And she she asks people questions, you know, and, and tr tries to help me find out if I should, uh, if this is a person God sent me or not. And here's the idea. You have to you have to keep an open heart because, you know, sometimes God uses an offensive person to test our hearts. Mm -hmm. So in those moments, you have to ask God to give you the ability to see the way he sees. That's why I pray, Lord, help me see everything the enemy doesn't want me to see today. You have to judge the tree by its fruit. And when you do this, Often God will bless you, as, as you've all heard the story about the women who came to me in Salem. So grateful for them. Had many encounters with wild folks who were true prophets of God. You know, this is my, my welcome sign, you know, came from a true prophet of God, Elaine, you know, in upstate New York. That I just, just got from Marguerite, you know, for those of you who didn't see it. Welcome. So, you know, when you do this, you're blessed. You're blessed. And all of this leads to this point. What do you do with rejection? Because even, you know, you may not be an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist. Actually, you know what? This can, it'll be really funny when you hear this next week because I'm going to teach on the evangelist, you know, I've been praying that God would send us an evangelist because we don't really have an evangelist in our house. And, we, and we're going to talk about this, how the fivefold works together and how you want to have a, all the fivefold operating. What do you do with rejection? You know, what do you do? I mean, I had an encounter recently this week with someone who is not walking with the Lord, in, in general, rejects me. He's not rejecting me. He's rejecting the Lord. And it's been a hard situation, and, and God's really given me a lot of grace in it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, 
that if a city doesn't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off your feet. In other words, you let go. You let go. You do not have to make everyone like you. Not everyone is going to like you anyway. But when they're rejecting Jesus and you, you don't have to you don't have to convince them or change them. This is where a lot of ministry stuff gets misguided because ministry people are always trying to get you to like them. You cannot change someone else. Let me say that again. You cannot change someone else. You cannot change someone else through prayer. You cannot change someone else through manipulation or convincing or apologetics or blah, blah, blah. You cannot change someone else. So you let them go. You shake the dust off your feet. They self-sorted. As I've said many times, it's not about you or your ministry. It's about Jesus. You're the performance artist carrying the message of the kingdom, reenacting Jesus in front of them. And they have to sort out their response to that. The person and how they receive you does not have a problem with you. They have a problem with Jesus. And when you do this, something really interesting happens. You are free from them. And often, you're free to let the grace flow. And I found that some of these people who don't like Jesus, the situation with me gets better. Which I find really interesting. Wow. Rejection hurts, but it doesn't have to be poison. When you let it go, the poison doesn't go in. So I'm going to end today with, we're going to pray. Next week, we're going to talk about the evangelist. And then we're going to go on to the pastor and teacher who are, uh, also work in tandem. The evangelist is unique, and then the pastor and the teacher work together. So if you've been, if you've experienced rejection, some of you need to be detoxed. You have to have the poison sucked out. Yeah. That's okay. So let you take a moment, just close your eyes. And you who are listening are invisible podcast family under the belonging house roof. You too. We ask you, Lord, to just call to mind, if you need to, a person that may have not received you. And just forgive them, send them off to Jesus, bless them. Lord, we thank you that the servant is not above the master. And that there are people who have been rejected in our house, all of us. Anyone who's a creative person has to deal with this. And so, Lord, we ask you to pull out the poison of praise and rejection, Lord. And Abba, we ask you to give us that sense of that it's okay to wipe the dust off our feet and let it go. So we release those situations to you. Lord, we ask you to help us judge a tree by its fruit. Lord, seal this word. We thank you, Lord, for what you're raising up in our house. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If these messages have helped you, please like, subscribe, support and share. You can find out more about Belonging House Fellowship in the description. 
no matter what's happening in your life, remember, fear not, God can be trusted. <laughs>